This may look like an ordinary cowless Canadian pasture to you. I mean, the birds are chirping, the cicadas are doing their thing, the cows aren't munching on the grass, and there's a distant spray plane noise that I won't know how to edit out. But wouldn't you know, something a bit more sinister is also afoot, and this pasture is home to one of North America's most invasive plants of this last century, diffuse knapweed. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. So this plant comes to us from a pretty broad region of Eurasia. East, southeast Europe, southern Russia, Syria, Turkey, in that region. But in that range, it's not a particularly weedy plant. It doesn't form these dense stands, doesn't choke out other native plants so much, isn't really a big problem for farmers. But ever since the late 1800s, early 1900s, when it's been introduced over here in North America, it's been a very different story. It was identified in North America for the first time in 1907, growing in an alfalfa field in Washington. So the most common theory is that it was brought over on a contaminated seed shipment from somewhere in its native range. It wasn't dealt with at that point, unfortunately, and so over the course of the next century or so, it grew to cover an area even bigger than its original native range, now being found in about 26 different states in the US and seven Canadian provinces and territories. By this point, it's considered naturalized in the western halves of both of those countries. So by that meaning that eradication is basically impossible because it spreads so far. So the best we can do is to try and tame it and keep it from taking over too much and keep it from spreading too much further. Here in this pasture I'm standing in and one other pasture just north of here are the only places in Manitoba where we know there to be diffuse knapweed. Now it's been here since at least the 70s and because it was a small and manageable population, there's been a concerted effort to eradicate it since then and hopefully keep it from spreading to the rest of the province. In fact, back in 1982 to 83, there were two students working full-time summer jobs just tracking and destroying these plants, self-titled in their reports as knapweed nippers. I like that. Fortunately, since then, the knapweeds area has shrunk, but boy are they persistent, so there's, it's still a work in progress. So just so you can recognize it in case you're in North America and it's invading near you, let's take a look. So the leaves are the main thing to look at, because of course it's not always flowering. So the leaves are long, hairy, gray-green, and kind of prickly, with very divided leaves. They kind of remind me of a really spindly arugula. It can be either an annual or a biennial, meaning either a one or a two-year lifespan. If it's a biennial, then in its first year, it'll look like this, a rosette of leaves. And in the second year, it'll use up all the nutrients it's been storing in its big taproot and bolt up with a central stem and make flowers and seeds like this one here. The flowers look a lot like white or pink thistle flowers, which does make sense, they are both in the same family. So why is this plant so bad that we want to get rid of it anyway? Well, there's a few reasons. First, thinking in the shorter term, it's economically damaging. This one has a tendency to grow in pastures, it has a harder time invading natural prairies, but it's not a very cow-friendly plant. It's got those tiny prickles that'll, if the cow, it eats it, it might eat it once, but probably not a second time, because it's got those pokes that they'll damage the inside of the mouth, maybe the intestines, other parts of the digestive system. It doesn't go too well for them. So as a result, the cows will start avoiding those areas that have the knapweed growing. As a result, if there's knapweed in your pasture, the actual usable area there is greatly reduced. So that goes for both cattle and for wild animals as well, like deer or bison. So. One study in BC found as much as 88% less usable area in places infected with knapweed. And back in the 70s, they were estimating about $58 million loss per year due to knapweed. And for the wildlife, that links back to the longer term effects, the effects on the environment here. See, this is one of the most invasive plants in the last century here in North America. And it has this bad habit of choking out a lot of other native plants, it takes over disturbed ground before other plants can get in there and then forms these dense stands further keeping other plants out of there. So it decreases biodiversity, increases erosion, and also takes away food and habitat from wild animals here. So how does that happen that this is so successfully aggressive here when in its native range it's not really a problem at all? Well there's a few reasons for that and some of them are still kind of being debated 
One of the biggest ones, of course, like a lot of invasive plants, is it no longer has its natural predators here to keep its numbers in check. But then there's a few other interesting reasons as well. First, it just has a lot of characteristics that make it really great at making and spreading seeds. One, it makes tons of seeds. One plant can produce as many as 18,000 seeds in a season. Two, those seeds are resilient. The seeds can sit as long as 10 years in the soil waiting for good time to sprout, and things like fires can actually even help them sprout further. Three, it's great at spreading those seeds. You'll notice the seeds are all fluffy-like and good at blowing in the wind and getting stuck to animals' fur or feathers, maybe even getting eaten amongst the grasses it lands on, and then re-dispersed elsewhere from an animal's backside. They can float on water and spread that way, and on top of it all, if the seeds haven't all blown off when this plant dies and turns into a skeleton, it can break off and blow like a tumbleweed. So talk about a stacked deck. Four, it's really great at growing in disturbed land, and if there's one thing we've got a lot of here in Manitoba, it's disturbed land. I mean, of all the natural prairies here, there's about less than 1% of it left. And if you count just tall grass prairies, that's less than 0.1%. Almost all of it has been converted into farmland at this point. When ground is disturbed by human activity, like digging a ditch, burning the land, plowing, and seeding, stuff like that, the species diversity is going to go down. And as a result, there's resources in the soil there that are going unused. And if a plant can come along and use those resources, it won't have a lot of competition so it can invade pretty easily. And the more plants that have been removed in an area, well, the more soil is going to be exposed and the easier it is for new seeds to get in contact with that dirt. So you have a plant that's good at spreading those seeds, big advantage. In the other pasture here, it looked like the knapweed was pretty much gone for a while there, but then the owner decided to renovate it, basically working up and aerating the soil. Next year, tons of knapweed returning in full force, just showing those, all those seeds that were locked away in the soil waiting to sprout. So second reason for its success, and this one's a bit controversial, but not only is it great at spreading its seeds, but it seems to be great at suppressing other plants' growth as well, and that's a thing called allelopathy. Now, if you like being the life of the party as I do, that's a great word to bring out, which basically means one plant suppressing other plants' growth through chemicals. This isn't that uncommon in the plant world, and again, while it's debated how much knapweed actually does this, it's been noted where it does seem to be doing it, not only are these chemicals more effective at suppressing North American plants versus Eurasian plants, which are more used to dealing with those chemicals, but it actually seems to produce more chemicals when it's grown in North American soil than when it's grown back in Eurasian soil. Like about three times as much. And it's hypothesized that this is because of the microbes in the soil, which back in Eurasia, those ones kind of suppress the plant and keep it from releasing as much of this chemical as it does like suddenly there's no limits over here in North America, so it can just release as much as the plant is capable of. And naturally, when you get it over here in North America, growing in these dense stands, as opposed to how it grows in Eurasia there, well, there's a lot more plants in a close area, so there's just going to be a lot more chemical in that area to begin with, making it a lot more potent and effective at suppressing other plants. And for the third reason for success, well, one thing that's always interesting to look at with invasive plants is how does the average plant in the invasive range differ from the average plant in its native range? In one of my first videos, I talked about the North American wild cucumber and how in its invasive range in Europe, it has one more seed than back in North America, showing how a small difference like this can make a huge impact. Often plants will be a bit more diverse in their native range, maybe with some being better at handling insect attacks, some better at handling shade or drought, etc. But when they're moved to a new place, suddenly they're facing a different environment with different challenges and different resources available, so the balance that existed before doesn't exist anymore. So here too, you can see a few differences from the plants in Eurasia, especially that the plants are larger here generally and slower to mature. So in Eurasia, these plants can be either annual or biennial, but here, the majority of the time, they're biennial, taking two years to develop. And this seems to help them in that they're better able to make use of the season's resources. See, if you have a short growing season and you just happen to sprout and try and do your growing in the worst part of a season when it's all dry and hot, well, that's going to be a difficult time. But if you have the whole growing season, you can live through the good parts and the bad parts and make use of all the resources possible in that time. And if you're sticking with a two year life cycle, well then, by the time the second year rolls around and you bolt and go to seed, 
well, you've had more time to collect more resources, so it just figures that you're going to be able to produce more flowers and more seeds. And that seems to be part of the reason why they're bigger here in North America than back in Eurasia. They just tend to take more time. So this seems to be a big reason for their success here in North America. While the population present here isn't as diverse, the plants that are here are the ones with a lot more general purpose traits to them. So the ones that aren't as adapted to surviving in particular situations, but can survive equally well in a variety of different environments and habitats. As scientists call it, a jack-of-all-trades strategy, which is particularly helpful in North America where disturbances tend to be pretty unstable and unpredictable. So on the more practical side, knapweed, if you see it, what do you do about it? And what is being done about it? Well, if you see it, report it to the relevant authorities and or kill it. So the most effective way to kill it is to pull or dig the whole plant up. But as you can imagine, that gets pretty tedious and leaves a disturbed spot where more seeds could potentially sprout as well. So to prevent that from happening, it's good if you can also plant a native plant there or something to take its place. Cutting or mowing also works, but only if it's long term, so the plant can't just grow back from the root and still produce seeds. Burning can work, but that's risky because one study has noted that even severe burns can help the seeds sprout, and if you don't burn it severe enough, well, there's still some root left probably then, and it can just regrow from that. Herbicides can work too, but they have their own downsides and wouldn't be doable on the massive scale that would be necessary at this point. And here we come back around to kind of the biggest reason that it's invasive here. Its natural enemies aren't here. Almost nothing eats it, or it eats it more than once. So what people have done to combat this is brought some of the insects that eat it over in Eurasia and tried to re-establish them here in North America. So far about 12 of these have been introduced, two of which haven't survived, and four of them which are pretty widespread. They haven't killed off the knapweed, but at least in the areas where they've been more successful, it's managed to tame down the knapweed in its aggressiveness so that it grows more similarly to how it would over in Eurasia. So we don't have any of those insects here in Manitoba, but we are hoping that the population here is small enough and we can just eradicate it before it even comes to that. So anyway, if you live in Canada or the States, this is a good plant to be on the lookout for. And if you find it growing in an area where it isn't naturalized yet, consider reporting it to the local conservation authorities. We don't have much of it here in Manitoba, and we'd like to keep it that way, for the sake of our farms and for our environment. So, this video has been brought to you by the Stanley Soil Management Association. They provide some environmental goods and services here in South Central Manitoba, with a focus on planting and maintaining shelter belts. And they've also been working to help eradicate diffuse knapweed here for a while now. Uh, and so yeah, a huge thank you to the SSMA. This actually marks the first time I've been paid to work on a video, which that's a pretty exciting thing for me. So yeah, thanks for that. Anyways, that's all I have for this week. As always, if you have any corrections, suggestions, or disparaging remarks, feel free to comment that down below. And if you like this video and would like to see more, liking and subscribing always really helps me out. So we didn't really have any of the biological control insects to show this time because, well, they're not here and the States is a bit of a no-go zone with COVID and all that right now. So stay tuned for next time when we'll actually be looking at biological control and action on another local invasive plant. So for that and more, join me next time on Ambling with Sam.